Thank you. Okay, okay Dorothy, take it away. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to, to those who know each other and those who don't, and new ones, old ones, around ones, everywhere. So blessings on each of you. Um, so as you know, this uh, series is sponsored by the Sisters of Charity of New Jersey and New York and ROAR, um, religious organizations along the river of which I am a member, proud member of being in that group. Um, I think the first thing to do this evening is to do, introduce my friend, Sister Carol D'Angelo, um, who will be introducing the speaker. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I'm just noticing a lot of us aren't muted. So um, if you can take uh, the chance, uh, the opportunity to mute, because yeah. we all sometimes forget to turn off our cell phones or someone talks in the background. So um, I'm going to mute everybody, Carol. So make sure you unmute yourself. Oh. Okay, so can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, I just want to say that as a friend and colleague of Nancy Lawrence, I am very happy um, that Nancy can join us this evening. Uh, I have personally been enriched by knowing and working with you, Nancy. And Nancy is and has been a major faith leader in the Laudato Si movement, even before the encyclical. Laudato Si on Care for Our Common Home was published in 2015. Nancy and I got to know each other early in 2014 when we joined in a national faith leader call. And it was ongoing, almost monthly calls to plan the New York faith contingency for the September People's Climate March in New York City. And since 2015, we have worked closely as founding members of the Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement, a chapter of the Laudato Si Movement. As a member of its steering committee, I can attest to Nancy's skills, her gifts, her time and commitment, especially as facilitator of its steering committee where she is valuable in helping us bring together individual Catholic leaders from various parishes and Catholic organizations in the New York City metro area to network, engage, organize, and sustain one another spiritually as we journey together towards integral ecology, care for creation, and climate justice. So I'd like to read you some of Nancy's background. And as you uh, listen, you can see how this particular goal is something, uh, Laudato Si goal is something that Nancy has really engaged in throughout her life. Nancy is an educator who has taught classes and coordinated training programs in various settings in the United States and Guatemala. Upon returning to the United States, she worked in New York City on many human rights and solidarity campaigns for Guatemala and Central America. She worked many years for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, where she coordinated education programs, worked as a legal assistant, and advocated for immigrant and worker rights. Nancy was the Peace and Justice Committee coordinator for her parish, St. Francis Xavier, in Manhattan. But in 2018, she established and continues to lead her parish's environmental ministry. When Laudato Si was released, it became a guide for her work and helped her focus on eco-spirituality and the urgency of climate change as a justice issue seen within the context of Catholic social teaching. I feel Nancy has been prophetic for many years in speaking out for climate justice and to the climate crisis. She is a Laudato Si animator 
and she trained in 2019 with Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Program in Atlanta, Georgia. As I mentioned earlier, Nancy helped form and is coordinator of our Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement and its steering committee. She's been a major faith leader with others on the steering committee in bringing to our attention the Earth Bill and ways to advocate for major climate legislation through Climate Crisis Policies Adopt a District Initiative. So when we look at this Laudato Si goal, community, resilience, and empowerment, I know I look to Nancy as an inspiration and a mentor, and I'm so glad we're all here together because in many ways, we are mentors, supporters, and inspirations to one another in our journey towards living more deeply, integral ecology and ecological conversion. So Nancy, welcome, and it's great to have you here. You need to unmute yourself, Nancy. All right, there we go. Thank you, thank you very much, Carol. I mean, a lot of what we've done in Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement would not have happened were it not that we were working so closely together and that you've put a lot of effort into it yourself. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to add to the reflection by recalling St. Teresa of Avila, who reminds us that we are the body of Christ with these words. Christ has no body but yours, no hands but yours, no feet on earth without yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on the world. I'd also like to remind us that the most recent IPCC report, uh, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, warns that climate change is happening even faster than previously predicted and that we may already have passed certain tipping points that means that there's no way of going back. I'd like to also recall John Lewis's phrase, good trouble, because when we're talking about advocacy, sometimes we get into good trouble. He did civil disobedient actions that he carried out on the basis of his faith for a very just cause. And some people are doing that sort of thing today for climate change. So what is the seventh goal? I guess you, you, you chose a union organizer type person to present the goal on advocacy. Okay. So the, the Laudato Si Action Platform Vatican website says that the goal is community resilience and empowerment and that they envisage a synodal journey of community engagement and participatory action at various levels. Actions could include promoting advocacy and developing people's campaigns, encouraging rootedness in a sense of belonging in local communities and neighborhood ecosystems. The Nancy, can I just interrupt you a second? Are you intending us to see your slides because we're not? You're not seeing my slides? No, you don't You don't have the uh, PowerPoint on. Oh, so sorry. Okay, so I guess I haven't shared my screen. Right. Thank you for telling me. Okay, now can Where you, you see it? Yep. Okay, okay, good. So the Archdiocese of Chicago elaborates on this and says that we advocate for ecological justice by identifying and developing a social and environmental policy focus, by establishing engagement with officials and decision makers, and by organizing social and ecological events. They also say that we can advocate for ecological ecological justice by identifying and developing a social and environmental policy focus, establishing engagement with officials and decision makers, and organizing social and ecological events. The, um, 
the Archdiocese of Chicago also talks about the resiliency part of this, that we can develop resiliency. I have two C's in there, I see. By analyzing the physical, social, and spiritual ways your community is likely to be affected by climate change and biodiversity loss. So they're looking to the future, okay? By making a plan to prepare for those changes, ensuring buildings are prepared for changes in heat, storm intensity, and sea level rise, and encouraging rootedness and a sense of belonging in local communities and neighborhood ecosystems, and develop a coalition to prepare for and respond to emergent crises. So how do I understand the goal? Um, by, I, I see it as being a public witness by addressing the, the crisis, by raising our voices of concern, by addressing policy, and by developing community ties that bind us together to face this crisis. I think there's no doubt that the crisis is, is with us already. Um, there are so many people that have suffered through climate related emergencies and crises now. Um, when we talk about resiliency, we're talking about preparing together for the impact. It's estimated that, that about a third of the US population has now experienced a climate related emergency event. We know that black and brown low wealth communities get hit the hardest and have fewer resources to recover. A resident of Native American community of Huma, Louisiana, which was destroyed just recently by Hurricane Ida last fall said, I'm tired of being resilient. I just want a break. I don't know where to start. So the National Academy of Sciences study estimates that there will be up to 13 million climate refugees in the United States by the end of the century. Even if humanity were to stop all carbon emissions today, at least 414 towns, villages, and cities across the country would face relocation. If the West Antarctica ice sheet collapses, researchers predict that number will exceed 1,000. So here we are in uh, New York City. And we were not prepared when Hurricane Ida came around last fall. It hit landfall in Louisiana. We never expected it to affect us in the north. Um, but the flooding affected significant parts of New Jersey and Westchester. And a lot of the roadways and subway stations in New York City itself were uh, flooded. So in our area, 45 people died, most of them trapped in their flooded apartments in the basement. Churches and community centers aided those affected, yet we still have not changed any of the laws regarding basement apartments. The Laudato Si Action Platform calls us to look at how our communities will withstand climate emergencies and the new normal situations brought on by global warming. Do we have cooling centers in our communities? Can our church buildings serve as one? Can we collaborate with communities in urban deserts to mitigate the problem? Can we look at our own communities and see what is needed in the event of a heat wave or a flood? What community bonds have we formed with other churches or community-based organizations to meet emergency situations? The environmental justice communities, and this is a, web, a poster for a webinar that we did on environmental justice communities. The environmental justice communities, which are communities impacted by a disproportionate amount of polluting factories, bus terminals, and waste incinerators located in their communities, are already dealing with resiliency. They've had to. As Elizabeth Jean-Pierre, 
the director of Uprose in the low income community of Sunset Park in Brooklyn said, we've been dealing with the challenge of resiliency for years. Environmental justice communities are organizing to address the environmental problems that they face. And it's just been recently that that's come to the fore for the rest of the population. If we're not from those communities, we can be allies. We can be allies in addressing the cause of childhood asthma in low income communities, which is caused by air pollution from chemical plants or waste incinerators and the particulate matter that they spew into the air. We can be allies to communities on the front lines fighting against oil and gas pipelines that damage their land and risk their water sources. The Dakota Access Pipeline and Line 3 in Minnesota are examples, though we have our local pipelines right here in the area to worry about as well. So we in New York have a statewide coalition that proposes to do just um, what we're talking about, to look at how can we make low-income communities more resilient. It's called New York Renews. And um, here's what, what they say about their organization. That it's the, they, they proposed this piece of legislation. It got passed in 2019, but it was a huge, huge effort to get it passed. And they formed a coalition of 300 organizations to help do that. So it's among the nation's most aggressive climate and clean energy law. It commits to 100% zero emission electricity by 2040. Um, it gets New York off completely off of fossil fuels by 2050 and mandates that 40% of state climate and energy funding be invested in, in the disproportionately disadvantaged communities. So that's, that's a really important aspect of their organizing. And a lot of the disadvantaged communities took part in the whole um, process of engaging uh, the state assembly and state senate to get this law passed. So just to quote from Laudato Si, um, paragraph 49, if you're interested, environmental destruction and climate change have a disproportionate impact on the poor and vulnerable many of whom depend on the land for food and income. We must hear and respond to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So that's really what integral ecology is about. Um, being ready, this whole idea of resiliency, being ready means looking out for our own institutional members, but we are also called to support policies and actions that increase the readiness of the communities of the least of these among us and of our neighbors and of other, our wider community. So going to the other word that is part of the seventh, the goal number seven, empowerment, um, that can sound like a scary word to some people. Um, we're afraid to talk about power, basically, in our churches. Um, we, it sounds a lot softer and nicer to say, talk about care for the earth and care for the poor. There are easier phrases, certainly easier than power to the people. Um, so with empowerment, we're talking about our own empowerment and the empowerment of, of communities that have less of a platform or don't have a voice or a place at the table for decisions that affect their lives. And in doing this work, uh, we have to be prophetic and raise our voices also uh, for our, with our concerns. Joan Chittister says, don't be afraid to speak. Be afraid of what will happen if the whole, to the whole truth if you don't speak. So it's a challenge to be more, to learn how to take on the more difficult parts of advocacy and we can't do everything. I don't expect everybody to get out and march. You know, some people just cannot do that. There are other things that you can do, though, to support those efforts. 
um, and to uh, talk with your, your um, elected officials on the issues that any march is, is marching for. So I wanna just say a little bit about being an ally. Um, being an ally means to acknowledge and be aware that many of us come from a background of white privilege. And it's different. It's a different lens um, that we have on what is taking place and how it needs to be addressed. And I have found that in working with some of the coalitions that I've been part of. Um, and I have had to walk away from some of the initiatives of a large coalition simply because I knew that people in my parish would not um, agree with the the platform of what the event was about. And people respected that. And um, we're still very uh, clear about wanting us to be part of the coalition. So you don't have to agree on everything to be part of a coalition. Uh, and there are things that you can be, uh, that you can participate in and you can pass on other things. Um, but I also bring up the Jemez principles for democratic organizing, which I think are interesting. And a lot of uh, grassroots organizations use them. This is just the summary uh, points. There are, are complete paragraphs. You can Google this, um, but it's asking you to be inclusive, to emphasize bottom-up organizing, to let people speak for themselves, not to speak for them work together in solidarity and mutuality, build just relationships among ourselves and commit to self-transformation. It is not just that we're working for the poor and that they're the ones that need to be changed, that we all are changed in the process of working together. Okay. Um, So there are multiple ways that people can get engaged and I'm kind of losing my place, I think for a minute here with um, the slideshow, but it, it's not just marches um, or civil disobedience. There are plenty of pledges that we can uh, promote. There are petitions that we can sign. There are sign on letters letters to the editor, social media postings, which I think are a way to influence um, people to think differently about some issues. And there are hearings that we can attend or testify at. Some others think of more radical ways to call attention to their concern. <laughs> I'll just point to Father Michael Newell and Reverend Sue Parfit who stopped a train in London on October 17th, 2019 for 77 minutes to express their concern for climate change. They were acquitted in January, just this past January, acquitted because of the justness of their cause. Or the five young adults, one of them Catholic, who were on a hunger strike to send a message to, to, to the stalled Congress that they wanted climate policies passed before the uh, climate summit in Glasgow, COP26. They actually didn't get what they were on the hunger strike for, um, but they did, and they stopped it when COP26 started. Uh, but that took a significant amount of commitment on their part. And in both cases, we're talking about a recognition of the magnitude of the crisis that is really staring at us. Um, and it's part of what John Lewis would say is good trouble. So before going on to some very specific examples from my parish, I'd like to just say a word about Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement and, uh, and about community, okay? With community, I think we need to keep in mind with all of this Laudato Si Action Platform that we're journeying together. It's a synodal journey of community participation. And how do we build community? Some of the things that we've done, 
when we've gone on a march, we've had sign making parties. We have photo ops at our events for social to post on social media or our parish website so that people kind of feel like, oh, they're being included, right? We have an annual dinner with the Metro New York uh, Catholic Climate Movement Steering Committee, pre-pandemic that is, with no work agenda, just being together. Um, the Laudato Si prayer circles have brought people together attending a liturgy together, going on ecology tours together. Several of us went to a community of uh, called Red Hook in Brooklyn, a very low income community with mostly people of color and a huge uh, public uh, housing project in it. So as much as possible, we make community building part of our ongoing events. From my parish's summer film ser series, we serve popcorn and snacks and lemonade to make it more social. Again, to promote that people talk with one another and get to know one another. Um, and then we also often divide up into groups. This seems like a, a given, but that after seeing a film or hearing a speaker, we divide up into smaller groups uh, to discuss it so that people can feel a sense of belonging and inclusion in, in everybody can have a chance to speak. So we also invite ideas from our audience. If you have things that you think that we should work on, let us know. So I think it's also important um, in terms of building community to meet people where they're at. I know that recycling bottles is not going to get us out of this mess. It's important to do it. I do it. I'm sure you all do it. If that's the person's starting point, that's where I need to meet him or her. And just see how we can journey together to go beyond that. So how do we get people involved in advocacy for justice? Keep in mind that Jesus didn't call his 12 key followers in a meeting or an assembly. He called them one by one. And we need to use that strategy as well. It's called personal outreach, where you take time to find out what a person is concerned about and where you would have common ground and invite them to be part of your circle of activism. And keep in mind that Pope Francis said, let's sing as we go. May our struggles and our concern for this planet never take away from the joy of our hope. So we need to find a way to kind of make some of this fun um, and motivating and energetic. Uh, Nancy, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but are you intending us to be looking at the slides because it hasn't moved in a long time? No, I haven't moved them for a while. <laughs> okay, somebody asked that question. So just so yeah, we know. Okay. 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 So now I, I'm going to just say a few words about Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement, which is a chapter of the Laudato Si movement. Uh, and this is the symbol that has been used for the for GCCM, which is now called the Laudato Si movement. Uh, they changed their name last year. Um, so we are a chapter that was formed, as Carol said, after the 2014 People's Climate March, in which there was a contingent of 25,000 people of faith in that march. Some of you were probably part of it. Uh, and the encyclical came out shortly after that in 2015. And some of us had come together and decided that we weren't going to just let this drop. We had put a significant amount of effort into mobilizing people and that we needed to continue the work. So there were five of us, Carol and I were two of the five. And um, it was soon after that the encyclical came out and that we used that as our North Star. Um, Carol's on the steering committee. We started with monthly conference calls and to this day we continue now with Zoom calls once a month. We held a conference in 2018 that brought uh, many people in the diocese together to uh, network, basically, to share ideas. We, and an important thing about that conference was that we had a follow-up day where we could invite the most interested people to come back and really get down to 
talking about how to network. So we do get ideas from one another and we motivate one another. And that's really an important uh, element of our work. Um, and this was um, a pledge that we came up with for the fifth anniversary of La Dauto Si. And at the time that it came out, we had to ask people to take this pledge online. So it was a little cumbersome. We weren't uh, too clear on how to get that out as well as it could have gotten out. Um, all right, so, well, I already went through that one, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little. So going to my parish, um, we usually have one or more um, issues that we deal with during the season of creation. And as many of you know, the season of creation is a five week period starting September 1 and going up through the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi. And so we usually promote our um, issues. It could be in the form of a sign on letter. It could be in the form of taking a pledge. It could be in the form of writing a postcard or a letter to your congressperson. We do this by tabling in the back of church. And we we um, we just take a corner of the church. We have somebody you know, at the table before and after all the masses to explain what it's about. And this was one of our first um, initiatives and it was to have people sign a pledge to live La Dauto Si. It was a way of, of uh, asking people to kind of make that personal commitment but it also gave us a start at having a mailing list uh, that we could email out to people about our upcoming events. Um, so one of the things that we try to do is connect education to action. We're always trying to ask at an event, what action can we suggest? you know, at the end of the event or at the end of a presentation. A good example was that we had a speaker, Dr. Erin Lothes, who some of you know, and she is on our steering committee. She's a theologian and she spoke at our church to the whole parish about clim the climate crisis, our role as Catholics to act and our energy sources. We had a table in the back of church where people could meet with a representative from a reputable energy, alternative energy company, Clean Choice Energy. And we called it the switch campaign. And we had people sign up to switch their house, their household electricity to a clean renewable source. Um, so that was connecting a spiritual kind of presentation to a very concrete action that people could take. We also advocate in relation to that for national legislation for clean renewable energy. So we have connected it up to policy as well. We do activities to connect education to advocacy. Um, we've started, we've instituted new recycling uh, measures in the parish building and we've tabled in the back of church for legislative measures that would ban single use plastic bags, plastic cutlery and uh, for policies at the city, state, and national levels. We did an educational piece first by showing the film, The Story of Stuff and The Story of Plastic. And this photo is from The Story of Plastic, which it's incredible to see how much of our plastic ends up in Asia. Um, and it really gets you to think about where does our waste go? So some of us have visited a waste manage, the waste management facility of, of the city uh, to actually see where some of our waste goes. And we connect then education to uh, advocacy with a national bill that is uh, called Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which phases out single use plastics and holds corporations responsible for cleaning up plastic pollution. So one of the big projects that we took on, and it was a project of Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement, but as is the case in most of the events that happen with Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement, a single parish has to kind of take the lead in it. And we took the lead for this one. And it was the Catholic bus to Washington DC in 2017. It was a calculated risk, 
risk. We didn't know if we would fill the bus, would we lose money on the bus? Uh, we promoted it in all the parishes that were part of the Catholic climate movement at that point, which was about eight at the time. Um, we decided though that we needed to be visible if we were gonna go all the way to Washington DC, why were we gonna go there and not be visible? So there were um, ideas for sign making on the website for this March. And we followed one of those ideas and made our flower posters very colorful. Um, we had a, a poster making party to do this. So it was fun. We, we had kids involved um, and it was community building and a lot of creativity went into it. Uh, and we ended up being very visible. I mean, there are photographs of us with our banner and our signs in a lot of different places, including on the Laudato Si uh, movement website. This was 100 days into the Trump administration and nothing positive had been done on climate. And of course, people came to the party thinking, oh, I'm gonna say I'm against this or I'm against that. But we decided that we wanted to have people make positive signs, try to be as positive as you can. And in the end, we didn't have one one sign that was phrased in, as a negative. Um, we talked about what are Catholics for? And um, I think that was one thing that also made it very uh, photogenic for a lot of the Catholic press. So we did get a lot of press coverage for this photo. Um, and um, it just amplified the fact that we had made the effort to go to the march. It amplified the message. And I think that's important to take into account that if we're gonna go to an event, a vigil, a march, whatever, be visible, <laughs> make your voice heard with your very clear, clearly printed sign um, that stands out. Um, all right. The other thing that we did with this was we had a prayer service on the way down on the bus that was led by Anthony Zuba, Zuba, brother Anthony Zuba. You can see him here in the picture with the red sign, a uh, Franciscan. He's now up in the Boston area. All right, if we just think about um, the fact that most parishes have a banner and that if they don't, that the environment ministry of that parish could make a banner. Uh, they're not that expensive uh, and that they can take that banner with them to rally so that they do stand out. Um, yeah. So if we just think about the nuns on the bus, I think all of us kind of think, oh yeah, we know what that looks like, right? Because they were very visible with their bus and with the signage that went with it. So another aspect of our work has been to support the youth. Um, and we support the Fridays for Future. Well, I'm sorry, here's another. Oh, there are a few more slides about some other kind of public witness actions that we've done. This was in front of Senator Schumer's residence in Brooklyn, uh, where again, we had signs. This was in coalition with a broader uh, group. Um, so we use their signs, act now, we order them ahead of time. And um, just kind of went along with what their campaign was. And here's another uh, event with Senator Schumer. Um, we also had um, a webinar a meeting with Senator Schumer as part of our legislative work. Here's another picture in another march where we took our banner, march behind it. Okay, so I got ahead of myself. Here's the youth, the part about supporting the youth. Um, so we've supported Fridays for Future, which is the organization that sprang up uh, as a result of Greta Thunberg's wit witness. Um, and when she came to the US, and, and docked in New York City, her boat came into New York City. Um, there were groups from two Catholic high schools. One of them was St. Francis Xavier, right next to our parish. And the other was Notre Dame. 
and they had groups that went down to greet her and meet her. And um, yeah, I also went and took this picture. But um, at the time, we also invited a young college student who was very interested in climate change and the environment uh, to promote the march and the climate strike and invite people to participate from the pulpit. She spoke after mass. The priest gave her, the pastor gave her, uh, you know, about five minutes. And um, so that helped not just, well, it helped inform people that it was happening and encouraged some people to participate in support of the youth. Um, and I, I consider that really important. Uh, the youth are the ones that are seeing ahead of them a future that doesn't look very bright. And some of them have uh, also the whole problem of feeling the anxiety of that, you know, has been felt uh, very heavily by them. So they need our support. There's um, a Fridays for Future strike coming up uh, on, I think it's the third Friday of, of March. Um, and, and since this first big one, we've, I mean, this is another picture of college students supporting the strike, a Fridays for Future strike. This is supporting some of the leaders. Xie here is a, a leader, current leader of Fridays for Future. Here in New York, she's spoken in international forums. She's spoken on panels with Al Gore. She's very articulate, you know, and it's incredible the number of articulate leaders that have come out of this movement. Um, but this is in front of the UN where several of us have gone to accompany them. It all stopped with the pandemic, but, um, it was, it was to accompany the youth in their, their struggle. Um, yeah, okay. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the legislative projects that we have. There are basically two and the one that we've given the most effort to and Carol mentioned it is the, um, what is now called the Earth Bill Network, okay? It started out as climate crisis policy, and that's an awkward kind of term. It still exists, but the Earth Bill Network is what we use now. And um, the strategy that they are using is adopt a district. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that we that this program, this organization, had a lot of people participating to come up with looking at all of the national legislation that was related to climate. And from among those to choose, um, it came out to be 11 pieces of legislation that would dramatically reduce um, pollution in the environment and the greenhouse gas emissions. So that was the criteria. And, um, you know, some people said, oh, we can never deal with 10 bills but people have had meetings with their congresspersons uh, and have gone through a slide a slideshow very quickly on the 10 bills, lumping some of them together because one is on plastic pollution. I don't have any uh, more slides on this, uh, but one is on plastic pollution, three are on regenerative agriculture and cattle, which is a big source of greenhouse gases that we don't think about in New York City. Um, two are on fossil fuels. One would end subsidies for fossil fuel companies, which I don't know if you heard John Kerry at the end of COP26 said it would be insane to continue um, subsidies to fossil fuel companies. Um, and another one would um, stop the federal permits for fracking. One is for justice for black farmers. Two are on forests one on reforestation and wetlands protection, and the other on supply chain of wood products coming into the country, import, like we wouldn't want them to come from um, criminal activity. We would want them to be crime-free and have be from a sustainable forest. Um, there are two bills on health, one on toxic pesticides and one on health disparities in environmental justice communities. So we've been 
um, meeting with our congresspersons and getting them to support some of these bills. I mean, that's what's empowering about this is that we actually have gotten Representative Carolyn Maloney and Representative Nadler to support several bills that they had not supported before. Maybe it's just because it hadn't come to their attention, um, but because we are constituents, we're divided up as constituents into teams, into the adopt a district strategy. Um, they know that it's important to us. And so uh, they, they have both uh, added their name to, to more bills. Since then, the Earth Bill has been formulated. And um, actually this week, this past week, uh, we found a sponsor for the Earth Bill, which is really, really encouraging. And uh, Congressman Espaillat agreed to sponsor it and Carolyn Maloney has agreed to co-sponsor if somebody else would sponsor it. And there are other uh, congresspersons around the country that have also agreed that they would co-sponsor if we found a sponsor. So it's hoping that um, this will all be given a number in Congress and so that we'd be able to refer to the bill by the number by Earth Day, which is April 22nd. That's the goal. The Earth Bill focuses on three aspects that would most um, kind of keep us in accord with the Paris Agreement, okay? The policy that we have now will not, <laughs> that's very clear. So one is the production of clean renewable energy that includes wind, solar, tidal, and existing water sources. 100% by 2030. Electrification of vehicles, again, 100% by 2030. Biden's plan had 100% electrification of vehicles by 2035. So this isn't so far off. It seems like a doable kind of goal. Um, and then regenerative agriculture would be to get corporations to change some of their practices that would um, capture carbon and keep it in the soil rather than let it go up into the emissions. Um, so to get um, the corporations to adopt re some practices of regenerative agriculture by 2030. So we're really talking about electricity, transportation, and food. And the strategy on this is adopt a district. And if any of you, uh, you know, want to join us with these teams, uh, you're certainly welcome to. We'd be happy to have you with us even if it's just to be part of a meeting where you do nothing more but introduce yourself and say why you're interested in the topic. Um, so it's this bill steers us away from what we're calling false solutions and uh, food and water watch food and water watch also calls them false solutions. Um, which um, have to do with some of the more kind of technical aspects of um, green hydrogen, blue or green hydrogen, waste to energy, um, biomass, renewable natural gas, gas, natural gas is not natural, um, and biofuels, which we think is not a good solution to the energy problem. So we don't expect that this bill will pass totally intact as an earth bill. But we're putting it out there to say, this is what is needed if we're going to meet our commitments with the Paris Accord. And um, anything less just won't get us there, <laughs> basically. So that we hope, the hope is that parts of it will be taken up in other pieces of legislation that are proposed as we go along. And it, it, in that sense, it's really important that it gets out there uh, so that people look at it and talk and look at what the rationale for each of the three sections is. 
So that's one um, environmental voter project, or I'm sorry, that's one legislative project that we're involved in. And I can tell you that I consider it a very empowering kind of uh, approach. People who have never talked to a legislator, their congressperson before, never thought they would talk to their congressperson, you know, have been very pleased to have meetings with them or with their aides, sometimes to meet them personally. And, um, and that has been empowering to people. I mean, when you when you think that, oh, my effort did make an impact, it they listened to me, number one, it that's empowering. So another uh, project that we participate in and promote is the Environmental Voter Project. It was formed by a Catholic up in Boston who noticed that people who have some kind of inclination towards uh, the environment, towards hiking or Sierra Club or any kind of relationship that would say, I care about the environment, didn't vote that much. And that it was always pretty low on the, the scale of what people used as a criteria for voting. So he started this program just to try to identify in any way that he could um, who might be an a quote unquote environmental voter and um, got data to support that and then has call in and postcard campaigns to encourage people to vote. It's nonpartisan, he doesn't ever ever tell people to vote for this candidate or that candidate, this party or that party. It's just vote as an environmental voter. And they, they call people to uh, vote, not just for the national elections, but also for their state and local elections. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting project. And um, So here's what he says, using every election as an opportunity to change voting behavior, we track our voters' long-term voting habits to maximize the cumulative impact of our work. And, and this is a graph showing the impact of how much of an increase they managed to get from the work that they had done. Um, an increase, I think it was of, well, it looks like 600,000 voters. So we've been impressed with that project. So I'm my next slide. Yeah, I just I put this slide up because it's, it's not my last slide, but it's, um, it's what can happen when the church hierarchy also gets involved. You know, this is from the Diocese of San Diego, and I'm sorry that it's not a, a fuller picture, but that's all that I could capture from the, the website. Um, but this is a big uh, demonstration sponsored by the social ministry of the Diocese of San Diego. And it very clearly is talking about, thank you, Pope Francis, and thank you for Laudato Si. And, you know, that's part of what I mean when I say be a witness, you know, let other people know how as Catholics we feel about this issue and uh, that we consider the, the environment um, sacred and that we consider the protection of people and the development of resiliency as sacred. So um, I skipped over a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Okay, back up here, I'm sorry. Um, this is a current um, initiative of the Earth Bill Network, which is to try to send postcards to the Supreme Court. And they, they on February 28th, opened a case that is West Virginia versus the EPA. And it questions, the whole issue here is how much power 
does the EPA have to regulate our air and our water? And uh, this could have just huge ramifications, you know, if they say that the EPA has no power to regulate. Um, and uh, because what, you know, what is polluting our air? Greenhouse gases. And uh, what needs to be stopped to stop global warming? You need to stop the greenhouse gases. Um, so this is just basically a postcard. The red outline part is one side with the message and then the kids are on the other side um, that we're doing it for the kids future. This is another um, card that, that some of us in a kind of interdiocesan group participated in coming up with. And it's, it's trying to say that protect life isn't just a choice or pro-choice pro issue. You know, that protect life also means preserve that which sustains life and care for our common home. So yes, we protect life in all its ways, but this is trying to say this, this way is also one way that should be given attention. So this, this card actually is on the USCCB website. It's kind of hard to find <laughs> if you need to access it. Both Carol and I can, can access it for you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention a few takeaways um, from all of the work that, I, that, that we've done. And uh, one is, you know, that there are different tools of engagement and I, I really don't have any slides for, for this. Um, there are different tools of engagement, but as I said before, uh, the petitions, the pledges, sign on letters. Um, most recently, there was a climate, Catholic Climate Action Petition of Catholic Climate Covenant that's in Washington, DC. There was also a Laudato Si Movement Healthy Planet, Healthy People petition. Again, these are petitions that can help you grow your organization or your ministry or your green team in your parish. Um, if you collect the emails with, with the people that are signing. Um, the Interfaith Power and Light also often has petitions. Um, and they actually help provide a platform for us for a petition that we put out related with global Catholic, well, with led out to see movement related to all of the, the congressional stuff that was going on last fall. Um, so just in terms of visiting officials, um, it's really good to get to know their staff and to let them know who you are and what you, what parish you're from, what you represent and be very clear about your ask. Um, and that when you have meetings with them, if it's more than one person that you divide up the speaking parts and are very clear about who's gonna, who's gonna say what, you know, that you need to prepare for these kind of visits. Um, that we need to view, I think, political engagement on behalf of the earth as an important way of protecting creation. I think also with partnerships and collaboration that we need to recognize that we don't need to agree on everything, <laughs> that we need to have some common principles and common um, things that we can agree on and work in coalition. We would not have been able to do some of these things had we not been working with a bigger, much bigger coalition than, than what we are. Nancy, yeah. excuse, excuse me, this is so fascinating, but people I'm sure have things they want to ask you. So if you could just wrap oh, okay. up in a few minutes, thanks. Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to say something about global and uh, local that I think any kind of local issue that we take up, we need to also relate to it to global. And um, kind of one example that I tried to make clear when Cardinal Rebot was here and was touring and visiting some of our up at the Mount and also at my parish to talk about how, 
how our use of electricity is actually connected to the fact that his islands in uh, Asia, the South Asia are sinking, that they're disappearing and that that is bringing devastation to those communities. Um, I think also that uh, I wanted to make a very clear distinction between being partisan and being political. Okay, that being political doesn't mean that we're gonna say, oh, go for the Republicans or go for the Democrats. No, it means that we're gonna talk about the issue and that um, actually the gospel message kind of is pretty, um, is pretty clear about that. When you have Jesus going into the temple and, and saying that he was sent here to bring the good news to the poor, release to the prisoners, care for or heal the infirm and disabled, end oppression and share wealth with the poor. That's pretty radical. Uh, so I don't have any kind of reservation about doing some of these issues in, you know, in a pretty assertive way. Um, I don't worry about the fact that it's political. It is political and I accept that. It's not partisan. Okay, and the last thing I'll just say is there's a difference I think also between charity and, and justice. And I know I'm speaking to some sisters of charity. I think we need both. Absolutely. And um, but I think charity addresses the problems that individuals have and that uh, justice, part of it, looks at the cause of those problems and tries to address them. And I know some of you know uh, Helder Camara from Recife Brasil who used to say, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. And when I ask why people are hungry, they call me a communist. So, um, yeah, I'll end with that. Um, and well, you yeah. know, we're, we're very grateful for all that you've uh, contributed here. It's wonderful. I just wonder if people could just take one moment of silence to just try to center themselves, um, in, in all the information that you have given us. And now in terms of participation, um, I just like to suggest a couple of short questions that you might relate to when um, asked, talking with Nancy. Um, what did you hear that inspired you? And what might you like to learn more about? So with that, we open the floor and you'll have to unmute as you ask your question. Or, or comment. Yeah, Nancy, could you stop screen sharing so that we can see everyone? Um, sure. For the for the questions. Great. You can just jump in, or if you want to raise your hand, however you want to um, do this is fine. Mary Ann, are you raising your hand? Tracy? I am, I am. I, this may be a rhetorical question, but um, I, I was uh, astounded, but not really surprised at the pile of plastic bottles um, in the recycle and that it was in another country. And so I guess my question is, when we recycle, what does that really mean? <laughs> does that mean that the United States just dumps them someplace else? Does it mean that they go someplace where they are literally recycled and used again? Um, are they melted and, and made into something else? Um, uh, I, I don't know. Um, and so that's, that was my question. Uh, so 
Marianne, what I know about it is that I think the answer is varied. I think that some of it, the most recyclable kind of things are actually bottles. And I'm not talking about detergent bottles because those are like heavily colored and have the residue of the detergent in them. So a lot of them don't get recycled, but uh, water bottles and juice bottles and things of that sort, they do. Those are the most recyclable kind of things. Um, other things, it depends on what grade of plastic they are and they all get sorted by the little triangle on them. They have electric sorters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the stuff that um, is not recyclable just gets uh, put into landfills. Or up until just recently, we were shipping a lot of it to Asia. And guess what was happening to it in Asia? They were burning a lot of it. It was just horrible to learn that. Uh, and they were dumping it into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And um, they had mounds and mounds and mounds of it. They just could not uh, even process it in illegal ways enough to keep up with it. So um, Asia finally said, stop, we're not taking any more. So it's been, it's been a huge change. And mm -hmm. during the pandemic, of course, we're all using more plastic containers because we get those clamshells. Everything's put into a clamshell. So they all, they, those usually have a triangle number on them and they, I think they, they are likely to be recycled. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Eleanor Joyce. If I could just say something about plastics. Um, Beyondplastics.org um, is an organization that yeah. is studying this and um, they're putting forth a bill for New York State, extended producer responsibility. That's right. Actually, many of the things that have the recyclable emblem are not recyclable. I uh, from I saw um, PBS um, videos. It's, even though it says recyclable or it has the, the diamond, it, it's Coke, uh, soda bottles and milk bottles were the two things that were said to be most likely. 8% is recyclable of everything that's thrown into our mess. Thank you. I'm sorry. And, and Eleanor, that's Judith Ng also, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. She's the same one that is uh, behind the national legislation that I mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Can I say something? Of course, Mary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really would like to see our communities to really get rid of the plastic dishes and the plastic cups and, and use the paper. Is it that much more expensive? Is that the reason we're not, you know, that people are not going to um, paper products? I guess it's more too. because I, I think as a religious community, I mean, I'm speaking for the mother house. It's, it's amazing how much plastic is thrown away every day. May I comment on that? Sure. Um, this is Donna. Um, we've done a lot of research and yes, uh, the biodegradable things are more expensive, but it's a matter of asking the question, is my congregation willing to spend a little bit more on something uh, when needed rather than plastic, uh, spend a little bit more for the earth. And I think it's a matter of, you know, looking back and, and asking that question, are we willing to spend a little bit more? I'll give you a real good example. We have a, uh, an organization, a sponsored ministry of ours, and it's a wonderful sponsored ministry. And um, they give a lot of food to people. And on special days, I cannot tell you the amount of styrofoam shells. I did some research because in our mother house, we don't use those anymore. We use something that's more expensive, but it's totally biodegradable. You can put it in your compost. Um, you know, it's more expensive, uh, our, our uh, food service, we researched that, but we're willing to do it. 
I am going, to, well, a group of us are going to go to our sponsored ministry and ask, you know, people donate these, these uh, styrofoam pieces as part of a community event. But the director has the right to say, after she knows about it, we don't accept styrofoam. We accept your donation, but please donate these. And people will donate, but they have to be educated. I think people choose the cheapest thing and the quickest thing, and it, many times it's styrofoam or plastic. But, you know, if, are we willing to pay a little bit more? Uh, are we willing to educate ourselves and educate our, our own sisters, our own communities, and our own sponsored ministries, I think is the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think with the pandemic uh, kind of ending uh, as, a, as a pandemic, we can get away from putting like one or two cookies in a plastic container and then throwing, you, you know, I mean. It's time right now. It's time, amen. Yeah, yeah. I think this is wonderful. And I think, you know, we're blessed to have um, Terry lead us in some of these endeavors. I'm sort of a parish floater, I'm Marion. I hear nothing about Laudate C in my area. And I go, you know, I probably visit about four churches. I hear nothing. It's a shame. You're doing really great work. You must have a good pastor over there in St. Francis. <laughs> Jesuits? Jesuit. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, I guess the, the really key thing is that there's a lot of latitude for lay people to participate and carry out these programs, you know, because many pastors are just really, really busy. And, um, you know, they don't want to take on any more responsibilities. But, um, you know, we you know do. you're saying, but other people will do it. Yeah. You know, I yeah, ex it's very helpful to have the pastor support, believe me. Yeah. And I'll tell you, one of the most important or uh, one of the biggest problems we had with recycling is that we bought compostable. We got everybody to on the staff, you know, to get into this compostable glasses for even the socials where we had wine, compostable uh, cutlery. But if you throw that into the regular plastic, which it looks like, right, then you've got a problem. You're contaminating the plastic. And wow. it's not, yeah, it, it's really uh, problematic. <laughs> Needs lots of education, right? Carol, you had your hand up. Yes, um, I, I just want to say, uh, first of all, I know Kevin is putting up um, links. I'm hoping we're gonna get these links. I've had to switch to my phone because our internet created a problem. But Marion, when you, um, there are probably several things I can say. But Marion, I'm going to ask Nancy to talk to um, what's happening in New Jersey. Um, Nancy, if you could talk about, um, and I'm forgetting her name now, because there are efforts in New Jersey where some parishes are more than involved than others. And, oh, and okay. To me, You're talking about Anne yeah, Anne Marie Brennan, Brennan. Anne Marie yeah. Brennan and their effort. But but this relates to this this particular goal that we're on. And this is the value, for instance, of our Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement. We have a lot of Catholic leaders who do not find support with their pastors or um, cannot find a group of people in their parish. Mm -hmm. Others find a group. And so um, what the Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement has done for a lot of individual Catholic faith leaders is to provide that group of support that then enables them to continue within their own parish setting or network with others. And this is mm -hmm. where this community resilience and empowerment is. We need to go together as yeah. a people. And if right. we can't find people very close to us, <clears throat> there is so much going out, going on. And so just one other point with this, because I think this is what Nancy has been a big help with us. Um, even I with my hundreds of emails and even reading them, um, Nancy is so much into certain national issues and regional issues that when we get together as a group, we will hear more about green faith's involvement or um, for instance, the climate crisis because no one person can do it. 
Right. And it's how do we work together as a group and each one taking their gifts and doing it. So um, Nancy has been able to do that. But Nancy, do share about uh, New Jersey, what's happening in New Jersey. Well, Anne-Marie Brennan is um, kind of the key person there. And she has formed like a diocesan uh, committee. And it's with the a blessing of the diocese. And there's a particular priest that um, I believe has had health problems. So he hasn't been able to be as present to them. Um, but um, yeah, the Cardinal knows about it. Cardinal. Open, yeah. yeah. Uh, right, so there are, there are people that are doing things in New Jersey, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, they had a beautiful uh, outdoor mass. I know um, it was during Laudato Sea Week uh, this past spring, a year ago. Um, That's great. Yeah, they, yeah, I just want to say that we're, we're getting close to when we will have to conclude this conversation. So does- Dorothy, anyone... can I say one more thing? You may, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's Ladato C movement offers an animator training, okay, which um, if you feel like you're by yourself in your parish, uh, you might just interest somebody else in your parish to take the animator training. It's not that intensive. It's mm -hmm. um, the next one is going to start on April 15th. Uh, if you want more information, you know, just talk to Carol or talk to me. We've both gone through the training. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's great. It, well, does anyone have a very last comment or question or shall we conclude here? Oh, Marie, you, you have your hand up and you'll, you'll be it. <laughs> okay. Uh, St. Al's in, um, St. Al's in another parish. Yeah, have gotten together. There are a couple of Dominican sisters who have done a lot. The Yules have done, um, gotten together for services. And also there's a, a parish, St. Lucy's in Newark, got the uh, green, got, had Murphy pass a law that they could um, redo an, an old railroad track for a park. There has, there are Spanish speaking people in St. Lucy's parish, Marion, you'd love them, um, in Newark and they're very active. Good, thank you. That's great. That's great. Well, I know there's probably more questions and thank God um, Nancy and Carol are, you know, um, available, I'm sure, for further uh, comment. Um, but now I, um, to conclude this wonderful series, um, Terry will lead us in a special prayer tonight. Terry, take yeah, it away. I, I hope you noticed we didn't have an opening prayer. We're having a, a closing prayer instead. And we're just going to prayerfully um, uh, go back to the beginning of this journey and listen again a bit to the uh, wonderful presenters that we've had for the past seven months. And then we'll conclude uh, with a, a song. So uh, I will try to share my screen now. Can you all see that? Yes. Um, yes, the goals. I think it, everyone should mute, right, Terry, so that you can hear your, yeah. Yeah, uh, that'd be good. If the source of the problem is religion. The path of healing must also be religion. Eric Anglad, Goda, and Brennan, Brennan, excuse me, Brenna Cusin Anglada. Since Francis is clear throughout the text that human beings have been guilty of absolute or irresponsible dominion over the earth, which manifests itself in pollution mistreatment of animals and plants, and in many other ways. It should be obvious that we have often ignored our relationship with Earth. The result of this much human failure is the further oppression of the poorest among us. 
Daniel Kasaki. One thing that has been made very clear to me by my COP23 experience is that climate dialogues are often exclusive spaces. They are white spaces. They are Western spaces and they are male spaces. Climate dialogue needs to emphasize diverse and non-discriminatory leadership if it wants to correct the issues that caused climate change in the first place. Jillianne Lyon. I don't really have the answer of how much each of us should be doing to help the planet. I would like to say, do as much as you can, that small steps are as good as large ones. But the truth is, we all need to be doing more. I do think that being aware of these issues and making conscious choices about everything we do is a really good start. And that maintaining hope and supporting one another's efforts is essential for us to move in a better direction. Carolyn Cromer. I think there is something in here about what our work is as parents or any of us whose lives are intertwined with children in one way or another. Some of the most radical work we can do in this moment is to help our children learn the land on which they stand. By doing so, we are nurturing them to fall in love with this place. And ultimately that love may lead to risk for justice on this planet. Lydia Wiley Kellerman. As the contemporary ecological crisis deepens, we urgently require more than instrumental remedies to stem the life loss of our, our ecosphere suffered at human hands. We need a penetrating understanding of the more troubling and mysterious pathology underlying it. Why indeed have we plundered our planetary paradise? Kathleen Degnan. We feel like Laudato Si calls us to be in the streets. I've read enough to really think that this is an emergency. It might not affect us directly right now, but I think we are all called to think about the common good. We are called to think about the least of these and the people who are the least of these are being affected by climate change. The uh, three sponsoring groups of this series, the Sisters of Charity of New York, the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth, and religious organizations along the river are very grateful to all our wonderful presenters that we just uh, saw a little recap of, and for the privilege of gathering with all of you across congregations and even across continents in this journey toward uh, integral ecology. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these vows. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds, 
So change a life from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the world. It is time now. And what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in the in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in the we shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these lives. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we fly. It is time we lead ourselves into the world. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these lives. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in So it's been, uh, we shall be known by the company we keep. It's been a tremendous pleasure to keep company with each other these past seven months. And uh, we all know it is time now. Uh, <laughs> so let's uh, take um, the wonderful richness we've, we've shared these past seven months and get out there and uh, be it and live it and do it. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. <laughs> And if you want to unmute yourselves and give a final clap or cheer, uh, <laughs> and then we'll uh, we'll end our evening. Yay! Brava! Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. You were just gracias. Thank you. You're very well. Great night. Thank, thank you. you. So well. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Blessings, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.